Lord of all creation, of water, earth, and sky. The heavens are your tabernacle. Glory to the Lord on high, God of wonders beyond our galaxy. You are holy, holy. The universe declares your majesty. You are holy, holy. Lord of heaven and earth. Lord of heaven and earth. Celebrate the light when I stumble in the darkness. I will call your name by night, God of wonders beyond our galaxy. You are holy. holy. declares your majesty you are holy holy hallelujah you're the lord of heaven and earth hallelujah you're the lord of heaven and earth hallelujah you're the lord of heaven and earth to me Father hold me hold me the universe declares your majesty you are holy 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 Amen Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time together. We thank you that we can praise your name, lift your name, refresh our minds, bring peace to our hearts, and just rest in you. We pour out our praise, we pour out our worship, and we eagerly wait the teaching on your word. Amen. I love you, Lord, for your mercy never fails me. All my days I've been held in your hands. From the moment that I wake up until I lay my head, I will sing of the goodness of God. All my life you have been faithful All my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am able I will sing of the goodness of God I love your you have led me through the fire in darkest night. You are close like no other. I've known you as a father. I've known you as a friend. I 
had left in the goodness of God. And all my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, I will sing the goodness of God Your goodness is running after It's running after me Your goodness is running after It's running after me With my life laid down I surrender now I give you everything Your goodness is running after It's running after me all my life you have been faithful all my life you have been so so good with every breath that i am able i will sing of the goodness of god and all my life you have been faithful All my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am able I will sing in the goodness of God I will sing in the goodness of God I will sing of the goodness of God Amen. When darkness tries to roll over my bones, when sorrow comes to steal the joy I own, when brokenness and pain is all I know, I won't be shaken. I won't be shaken. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. Shame no longer has a place to hide. I am not a captive to the lies. I'm not afraid to leave my past behind. I won't be shaken, I won't be shaken. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. Break off every chain. There's power that can empty out a grave. There's resurrection power that can save. There's power in your name. Power in your name. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. Stand
panting in your love Standing in your Amen. Can you please join me as we pray over uh, all of the kids here with us this morning? Father, we thank you for these kids. And your eyes look upon what may be considered the least among us. You see them. You love them. And you are pursuing them. And we just lift up these kids before you in the name of your son, Jesus. And the church says, amen. amen. All right, kids, you guys can be dismissed, preschool and elementary. You have your leaders and teachers in the back. We love you guys so much. Oh, my goodness, church, take a look at this. Take a look at this. This is beautiful. This is beautiful. Hey, as they leave and as they make their way to Kidstown. Can we just take a moment to greet one another, those sitting by you, around you, maybe even across court from one another. Feel free to greet 
each other with the greeting of Christ. Morning. Sir. So glad you're here. Good morning. Morning. All right, we'll do the reading of Scripture in just a moment, so feel free to have a seat uh, whenever you guys are sick of each other, which doesn't really happen here. Uh, we, we actually love each other and we like each other, which is cool. I just want to talk about dedication real quick. Dedicating a baby or a young one means that there is a recognition, a declaration, and an invitation. Uh, first, there's a recognition. Parents recognize that before they held their children in their hands, 
their children were held and fashioned and formed by the hands of God. Psalm 139, 13 through 14, for you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. Parents recognize that before these children ever belonged to us, they first and foremost were given to us as a gift by God himself. Psalm 127, 3, children are a gift from the Lord. They are a reward from him. And this is really important to hold on to because despite certain narratives, children are not an accident. They're not a mistake. They're not an inconvenience. They are precious and gracious and rambunctious <laughs> gifts from God. Dedicating a child is first a recognition. It's also a declaration. Children are a gift given to us from God, but they are also a gift that we dedicate back to God. Hannah, if you're familiar with her story in the Old Testament, she struggled with infertility and was even mocked for it at one point. But God mercifully and miraculously allowed Hannah to become pregnant. And when the boy was weaned, she dedicated him back to God saying, I prayed for this child and the Lord has granted me what I asked of him. So now I give him to the Lord for his whole life. He'll be given over to the Lord. And in the same vein, we see child dedication as a public declaration of the parents' desire to give back to God what he has given to them. And by the guiding truths of Scripture and the equipping power of the Spirit, parents who make this declaration, they really make Deuteronomy 6, 5 through 7 their aim. It says, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road and when you lie down and when you get up. Just have Jesus in your conversation. Oftentimes, if we're being honest, though, this is easier said than done. We parents, we fall and fail every day in doing this. But even in our struggles, may we rely on God's grace to point our children to the saving grace of God revealed and available in Christ Jesus, a saving grace that both parent and child alike desperately need. Dedicating a child is a recognition. It is a declaration. It's also an invitation. Parents express before you their desire to see our children know Jesus but parents also express before you that they can't do this on their own, and they're not meant to. They need the church. They need a community that is built around Jesus to come alongside them and love their children with a Christ-like love. Now, it's hard at times to ask for help because we live in an individualistic and do-it-yourself society, and we have the pride of our own flesh mixed in that equation. But we know that faith in Jesus brings us into a kingdom and into a family. So in directing a baby or a young one, parents are inviting their kingdom community, the family of God, to love and help and counsel and support and point their children to Jesus. All this to say, I want to bring up Jason and Emily and their two children, Jameson and Dawson. Come up and join me, guys. The peace of God <laughs> that transcends nap time and church services and all logic. Wow, amazing, amazing. Do you guys just want to introduce yourself and then I think you have a scripture to be read? So, so I'm Emily, this is Jameson, this is our son Dawson, and then my husband Jason. Um, we chose a verse that we feel really reflects on, especially the time right now where there's a lot of darkness in the world, so we just want to be able to have them show their light. We chose Matthew 5.16, in the same way, let your light shine before others, 
so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. So the biggest thing with us standing up here is we ask you and invite you to be a light to our children and to pray over them that they can be a light to others as well. Because right now, with, like I said, the world is hard right now. And if our boys can be just that little bit of light for somebody, that's all we can hope for. So. Well, these two have made a recognition, a declaration, and right now they have extended an invitation. And so I just want to invite this invitation for our church and specifically uh, their family to come up, whoever is led, and they can hug them, hold them, extend a hand. And if you want to stay where you are, I just ask that you extend a, a, a loving and prayerful hand their way as well. We dedicate you in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You're awesome, Jameson. You're so loved by God. Dawson, we dedicate you in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You are so precious and loved by God. Let's pray. Father, before these children ever breathed their first breath outside the womb, you knew them. You saw them. You knew them by name. You love them so much. And you see them. And you have a plan and a hope and a future in store for them. God, may you be with Jason and Emily. And equip them and empower them to be parents who disciple their children toward Jesus. May Jesus be ever on their lips at home, at work, as they go on walks, as they drive in the car, as they do bedtime and nap routine. May Jesus ever be on their lips. Create within them soft and sensitive spirits toward your Holy Spirit. Be with this family that is on the stage today to come alongside them in grace and truth and for their church family as witnesses and participants in this dedication to come alongside this family and to point their kids to Jesus. We pray this in the name of Jesus, our Savior and King. Amen. Amen. Thank you, guys. Good morning. I'm Rob Horgan, worship team, AV booth, board member, <laughs> yeah, spiritual warrior, yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Our, our scripture this morning is Matthew 6, 13, and you, you can stand. When I looked at the scripture, I thought it's pretty much a standalone, and, and to come up after a, a dedication seemed out of sync, but it's not. It's not. If we seek Jesus, if we spend time with and walk with Jesus and do what Jesus does, we set the example for our children and for everyone who sees us, knows us, ties into this verse so well. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. This is the word of the Lord. Praise be to God. You may be seated. Building a community that is built 
around Jesus. This is the mission statement of our church and how we do this. We do this by knowing how to be with Jesus and become like Jesus and to do the things of Jesus. And one of the primary ways of being with and abiding in Jesus is through prayer. And this fall, we've been covering several movements of prayer, such as silence and adoration, confession, petition, and intercession. And this morning, as we're focused on being with Jesus, we're diving into the next movement of prayer, protection. As Rob just read, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. But if we are to pray for protection and deliverance from evil, then we must affirm and be aware of two things. First, we must affirm the beauty and the majesty and the power of the Holy Trinity, of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And we must also be aware of the fact that there is an unholy Trinity at war with every human being, the world, the flesh, and the devil. A word on each. The world, or as Jesus and the Apostle Paul often described it, this present world, or this present time, or this present evil age. It's a term that captures the corruption and futility that creation is currently subjected to before Jesus comes again to liberate creation and renew all things. The world or this present evil age is full of religions and ideologies and philosophies, policies, structures, and systems that are fundamentally opposed to the kingdom of God. This world speaks of the collective ideas and efforts of mankind to create new towers of Babel in order to ascend to heaven or their version of it with no need for God. The ways of this world promises freedom and salvation, but only perpetuates sin, keeps people in bondage, and will eventually pass away with the age to come as it arrives. And then there's the flesh. This isn't a term for our physical bodies that God will one day resurrect and transform, just as he did the body of Jesus. Rather, the flesh is a term for our sinfulness. It's our deep distrust of the Father's goodness that causes us to wander away like prodigals. It's our bent from birth, our rebellious inclination passed down from Adam to resist God's rule as king so we can do what we want, when we want. And even as followers of Jesus who have received a new identity and authority through the power of Jesus' finished work and through the Holy Spirit, we still battle daily against this inclination, against our flesh. As Paul wrote in Romans 7, 19 through 20, for I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. Now, if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I who do it, but the sin that dwells within me, this flesh of mine. There's the world, there's our flesh, and the last part of the unholy trinity is the devil. He is the chief fallen angel who fell before the fall of man. He fell because he attempted to usurp God's reign and rule, but was expelled from the kingdom of God, taking a third of God's angels with him, and those third we call his demons. The devil is a slithering serpent who subtly whispers lies and deceit. He is a prowling lion who wants humans to be devoured by sin and death. He's the accuser of the brethren who speaks condemnation and stirs up division. He's the God of this age who blinds the minds of unbelievers. He is more than a fictional character with horns and a pitchfork. He is the evil one, our adversary, who is full of fury hating the mere sight of God's children. This is why Jesus said as he prayed for you and for me and for all his followers in John 17, my prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. Now I know it's so easy and we're so tempted to view people as our enemies and they might be animated 
to be so. But our true enemies are not flesh and blood. Our true enemy are, is the devil and his demons. That's right. For they are the ones who pull the strings of evil. They're behind the curtains. They are, they, they are responsible ultimately for what we see. They hold in captivity those who haven't yet believed in Jesus. This is why Paul writes in Ephesians 6, 10 through 12, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against that Democrat. <laughs> no, that's not what Scripture says. I'm just keeping you on your toes, church. So you can take your stand against the devil, not flesh and blood, not any person, not any human, that you can ultimately take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. And y'all, this is why God in Christ came down from heaven. In the person of his son, God flipped the systems of this world on their heads. In the person of his son, God himself collected and covered and conquered our sin. He loosened the grip of death. He destroyed the works of Satan, rescuing us from this present evil age and redeeming us as co-heirs of his eternal and indestructible kingdom. Amen. Jesus has overcome the world, the flesh, and the devil. But brother and sister, we must remember that we live in between the ages. We live in the in-between. We live in the now, not yet. So though the war has been won in Jesus, there is a battle that continues. Though the devil and his demons are defeated, they still actively oppose and attack the inevitable advancement of God's kingdom. Though Jesus has achieved the decisive victory over our spiritual enemies, he will one day return and reveal that victory as final. That being said, we're not a people who kick our feet up. We are in the fight of our lives. And if we are people who truly want to be with Jesus and become like Jesus and do the things of Jesus, we must remember that the three major things Jesus did throughout his earthly ministry was, number one, preach and teach the good news of God's kingdom. Number two, heal the sick. Number three, deliver the demonized. And I'm using the term demonized because even though we mainly see throughout the pages of the Gospels the English phrase demon-possessed, that phrase actually comes from the Greek word daimonetsamai, which means demonized, and more generally speaks of one just being inflicted and tormented by an evil spirit, and this can mean possession, but it doesn't always mean possession. So what else does demonization entail? In my reading and study and throughout my experience in ministry, I'd say that there are three degrees of demonization. There's ownership, there's oppression, and there's influence. Okay, there's ownership. Now, contrary to popular belief, and honestly, it's still a hard pill to swallow, even for those of you who go to church. But here's the truth. Humans are either owned by Satan the deceiver, or they're owned by Jesus the Savior. We either live in the kingdom of darkness, or we live in the kingdom of light. We either open ourselves up to be a potential place of residence for evil spirits, or we have received the Holy Spirit who fills us and permanently seals us for the day of redemption. Yeah. Okay, listen to this in Romans 6, 18. Now you are free from your slavery to sin, and you have become slaves to righteous living. Y'all, here's the truth. We are slaves and servants regardless of where our allegiance lies. So the question is, who is your master? Who do you serve? What kingdom has your allegiance? And if we trust in Jesus and what he's done for us, then we know that the Father himself has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves. This is in Colossians 1. In whom we have redemption, the forgiveness 
of sins. In other words, when you come to trust in Jesus and what he's already done for you, ownership changes. <laughs> you're forgiven, you're freed, you're claimed, you are spoken for. So when it comes to de demonization, where there's ownership, there is an opportunity for demons to dwell and possess. Now, why do demons want to dwell inside people? Okay, well, number one, every single person is made in the image of God. Humans are made to reflect the creator. So every time a demon sees a human being, they see the reflection of their enemy. They hate humans because we are the living embodiment and image of the one they've rebelled against. And since they cannot touch God, they seek to torment God's most beloved creation, his image bearers. Secondly, the other reason why demons want to dwell inside people has to do with the throne. Satan was once an angel but became prideful and sought to usurp the throne of God, but that didn't really work out well for him. So after Satan fell like lightning from heaven, as Jesus described, taking a third of the angels with him, the next best throne to occupy is the human heart, the inner being of an image bearer, the place of worship and the root of devotion. The heart is where God is meant to dwell and rule from. That's why Jesus said that the kingdom of God is within you. So every time a demon sits on the throne of a human heart, it is an act of defiance and mockery towards God. Now, what does this mean for you and me? It means we need to be a people who not only pray for our own protection and deliverance from evil, but we need to be a people who pray for the deliverance of all those who are under the tyranny of the devil. Amen. How often are we praying for these people. And if you are ever confronted by one who is possessed, like there's true ownership in their person, and there's an opportunity to expel that evil spirit, please remember these three things. Number one, never do it alone, for you have brothers and sisters ready for battle, and community is the design of God. Number two, never be afraid, for he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. And number three, do not do it on your own strength. You will be bullied and beat up if you do. But you do this in the name and by the power and in the blood of Jesus. There's ownership. And then there's oppression. Time out. How are we doing so far? Are we tracking? Okay. For those of you who are new to Laurel, welcome. <laughs> We're really glad you're here. There's ownership, and then there's oppression. Now, I just want to say one thing about mental illness, okay? It's real. Yes. It needs to be addressed. Yes. Okay, it needs to be worked through. <laughs> and not every medical diagnosis is a symptom of the demonic. That's right. And if we treat every single medical diagnosis as a symptom of the demonic, we will do great harm to many people. But in some cases, it can be. In some cases, one can love Jesus truly and experience internal and ongoing demonic oppression. One can have the Holy Spirit and have an ongoing battle with self-hate and thoughts of suicide and depression and even abnormal bouts of exhaustion. Yeah. Quick story, I experienced the latter three years ago. I flew to Montana, I preached at a high school summer camp, and I came back, and that next Saturday and Sunday, it's back when we did two services, and a short little one on Saturday night, and, and one in the morning, and I, for that whole week after that youth camp, and there were kids that came to faith, and kids that were baptized, like God was in our midst doing a mighty thing, that whole next week, I couldn't get off the couch, I couldn't get out of my bed. I had no desire, no energy. I was absolutely and abnormally drained. That Saturday night, I preached a message, 
And guess what the message was on? Exposing the schemes of the devil. I literally could not stand. I had to sit on a stool, and I was out of breath after the intro to my message. And I look across the room, and we had the majority of our governing board, our, our, our leaders of our church, and I just said, can you guys please pray for me? I don't have anything. And I was prayed over, and hands were laid on me, and that next morning woke up, and I was good. I was good. Energy was restored. Okay, oppression is real. That doesn't mean ownership, but that there can be an internal battle waging in the members of your body. Oppression can also come as a result of not only the enemy's full-on fiery attacks, but oppression also can be a result by means of living in habitual sin. Now, brothers and sisters, if you have the spiritual gifting of discernment and faith and healing, we need you. And we need your gifting in the life of the local church because by God's grace, he works in you and through you to help identify and address and pray through the power of the Spirit for the deliverance and the healing and the freedom over sins, strongholds, and the schemes of Satan. Again, oppression doesn't mean occupancy. But it does mean an evil and ongoing attack that can happen both externally, a force opposing you, or internally, a fight within you. Now, some of you might be thinking, internally? How can the Holy Spirit's residency and demonic internal activity coexist? I thought evil couldn't be around what is holy. Well, let me just challenge you with four quick thoughts. Number one, God is omnipresent. He's everywhere upon the earth. And who else do we read of that roams the earth? The devil. The devil. Okay, there's a shared space there. Number two, along that same line, have you ever read Job? <laughs> Satan actually enters the courts of heaven and has a conversation with God about Job. Number three, the devil was right next to Jesus, talking to Jesus, trying to tempt Jesus in the wilderness. Number four, do you remember Ananias and Sapphira? Their dishonesty led Peter to say, Ananias, okay, listen to the language, how is it that Satan has filled your heart that you have lied to the Holy Spirit and have kept for yourself some of the money you received for the land? Oppression can be both external and internal. Internally, think, think of this analogy of a house. What if the owner of a house leaves a window open and burglars enter the house through the window? Does the house belong to the burglars? No. But can the burglars still enter and do significant damage within the house that they do not own? Absolutely. The same is true with demonic oppression. One can belong to God, yet leave a foothold for the devil, which can lead to significant spiritual damage damage, which then leads us to influence. There are small and subtle ways in which we give evil a foothold for the devil. Ephesians 4, 26 through 27, in your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry and do not give the devil a foothold. Okay, young married couples, can I just speak into your relationship really quick? Do not go to sleep angry with one another. Stay up all night and duke it out. <laughs> fight fair and continue to fight. Don't go to bed being on opposite pages. Seek restoration. Do not give the devil a foothold. You can feel anger, but do not go to bed angry. Many of us, we leave wiggle room for satanic influences and agendas to wreak havoc in our minds and in our hearts and our imaginations and our emotions. Yes, people are messy. Yes, you and I 
are messy. The church is messy. Oftentimes, we step on each other's toes. We can even tick each other off. We even fight and argue at times, which is why we need to take our thoughts captive, to give our brothers and sisters grace and the benefit of the doubt, to avoid at all costs gossip and slander, and to pursue healthy, clarifying conversation. We need to constantly and proactively seek to shut the doors to the devil and his schemes, taking away any potential foothold for him to grab a, a hold of. Amen. Influence. In other words, in the language of Jesus, temptation. In the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus told his disciples to, quote, watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Peter echoed the Lord's command, writing, be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. James tells us to submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Paul instructs us to put on the full armor of God so that we can take your stand against the devil's schemes. And in Romans, to hate what is evil, cling to what is good. In his letter to a young pastor named Timothy, Paul writes, flee from evil desires of youth and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace along with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. And he insisted that the church in Corinth do the same thing, flee from sexual immorality. Church, did you catch the language? In the midst of temptation, we are called into action. Flee, pursue, hate, cling, stand, put on, submit, be sober-minded, be watchful, watch and pray. In the midst of temptation, we are called into action. Y'all, so many of us, we want to flirt with sin as Samson did. But we are called to fight against sin. So many of us, we want to see how close we can get without crossing this line or that line. Well, technically, but we are called not to flirt with any line. We are called to proactively flee from the slippery and insidious nature of sin and pursue what is right and true and lovely and pure. Proverbs 6, 28, can one walk on hot coals and his feet not be seared? In other words, if you're going to play with fire, you're going to get burned. Stop playing with fire. Brothers and sisters, how is God calling you into action to fight against temptation and the schemes of the devil? Is it downgrading to a flip phone without internet? Or giving someone visibility to your search history? Or restricting what you watch on Netflix? Or saying no thanks to a night out in a certain environment you know compromises the health of your soul? Is it asking for and actually receiving accountability from a brother and a sister? Maybe it's going on a walk or taking a cold shower or working on a project when temptation just doesn't seem to go away. Maybe it's getting up early and praying through and putting on the armor of God or waking up early and walking around your property and praying prayers of protection. Maybe it's moving and finding a different place to live for a period of time. Maybe you're with your significant other, okay? Eh, not one you're married to, let's just say boyfriend or girlfriend, and it's 10 o'clock, and guess what? You go back to your place alone. Because <laughs> as mama used to always say, nothing good happens past 10. <laughs> it was homecoming night last night. Whew, okay. <laughs> Maybe it's the practice of reading scripture and writing and posting verses in your room all over, maybe even having a Bible ready in your car. Yes. And, and on the note of scripture, do you know how Jesus resisted the devil's temptations and combated his lies? By knowing, reciting, and standing on scripture. Psalm 119.9, how can a young person stay in the path of purity? By living according to your word. 
Now, I'm well aware that some of these suggested practices and steps of action might be a bit different, right? Even a bit weird, like, I don't know what to do, cold shower. But if that's the case, if this is weird, then I think it's time to be weird, church. I think it's time to look a bit odd. One pastor defines worldliness as this. Worldliness is what makes sin look normal and righteousness seem odd. In the midst of temptation, we are not called to just passively flirt with it or take it. We are called into action. Now, listen to me. It is our action that is the act of extending our hand and receiving God's provision. Action alone is not how we defeat the the, the, the flirtatiousness, the, the luring power of temptation. It's not action alone. Our action is the act of extending our hand to take hold of God's provision. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. In other words, you're not alone. Okay, I want to stop you right there. Some of you in your fight against sin a particular and specific sin, a sin that you haven't really confessed to your wife or your husband, a sin that you want to keep hidden, by no means you're not going to confess in the church. All this, right, unconfessed sin leads you to isolation. And here's what the devil wants you to do. He wants you to think that your sin, your battle, your struggle against this is so hideous that if you were to ever confess it, you'd be rejected by it. He's a liar. He's a liar. He wants you to think that maybe you're the only person in this room that struggles with this. He wants to make you feel alone. Here, Paul says, it's all common. You're not alone. Okay? And he continues. He says, and God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide, that's the provision I'm talking about, he will provide a way out so that you can endure it. Our act, our action is an act of taking hold to that provided way out, God's provision. Okay, God's provision, your way out of temptation, please hear me, it's not ultimately a technique or a method, or a practice. God's provision, your way out, is himself. It's the person in the presence of the Holy Spirit inside of you. Listen to Galatians 5, 16. So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Paul says it again to the church in Thessalonica. The Lord is faithful, and he will strengthen you and protect you from the evil one. Y'all, in the midst of temptation, we cannot rely on our own might, but on the mighty and merciful high priest who understands our weaknesses and helps us in our time of need. Hebrews 4, 15 through 16, "For, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way. Just as we are, yet did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. But when we do fall into temptation, because we have failed to simply reach out our hands and take hold, of the power of God's grace, his provision, our way out, then brother and sister, we need to repent immediately. St. John Chrysostom, an early church father of the fourth century, said, pay attention carefully. After the sin comes the shame. Courage follows repentance. And Satan upsets the order. He gives the courage to sin, and the shame 
to repent. This is so random, but some of you guys need to stop reading just from theologians of our day and go dig up some early church fathers. They are wise. Satan wants you to sit in shame and be slow to repent. Why? Because repentance isn't only the fact, only, isn't only the act of acknowledging our sin. Repentance is the act of renewing our minds. Repentance brings us back to the liberating truths of the gospel. Repentance picks ourselves up to the transformative power of grace. Y'all, you have to be able to really properly define repentance. Repentance isn't what we do to get back on God's good side. Repentance is how we remember that God is on our side and he's ready to fight the next battle with us. Repentance is how we get back up and tell the devil that though we lost that battle, he will lose and we will ultimately win in the end because we are joined to Jesus. Amen. This is the power of repentance. Martin Luther once said that when the devil throws your sins in your face and declares that you deserve death and hell, tell him this. I admit that I deserve death and hell. What of it? For I know one who suffered on my behalf. His name is Jesus Christ, Son of God, and where he is there I shall also be. Some of you, you have been battling with the sin of lust. And it's the same cycle of renewed willpower to failure, to discouragement, to shame. And there seems like there's no breaking of this cycle. I just want to tell you that in the end, you will win. You were joined to Jesus. Some of you, when you just listen to what Paul wrote in Romans 7, how you do what you don't want to do, but what you don't want to do, you keep on doing. Some of you, that is your anger. You just have bursts and fits of anger and rage, and you snap on the people that you've made a promise to yourself you won't ever snap on. You've raged on your kids, and you see the fear of your kids in their eyes, and you're thinking to yourself, why can I not overcome this anger? I just want you to know, brother and sister, you're joined to Jesus. You'll overcome it. Some of these sins that you've battled with, your flesh, your weaknesses, your susceptibility to a certain sin, there will be victory. Keep fixing your eyes on Jesus. And when the devil tries to bring up your past, you bring up his future. Amen. You will win because you are joined to the one who is one. That being said, can we take communion real quick? There's a little packet to the chair in front of you in the back. If there's not, not one by you, can you raise your hand real quick? Let us take of the bread and remember the body of Jesus that was broken for us. His broken body, the stripes across his shoulders, the marks across his back, the weight of sin upon his shoulders, his breaking for your healing. Take and eat and remember him. And can we take of the juice?
symbolic of his blood. A powerful symbolism, by the way, that there is real power here. There is real presence here. The blood of Jesus willingly and lovingly shed on your behalf. Blood of Jesus that covers our sin. The blood of Jesus actually has the power to break sin. His life covering our death. His blood poured out for us. God himself doing everything necessary for us to share a restored and eternal relationship with him. Take and drink and remember Jesus. The reason why we just needed to take communion right now is that we walk out the reality of Revelation 12. In Revelation 12, we read of the saints triumphing over Satan because of the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. I want you guys just to be in a position to receive. That could be standing, sitting, hands open, but I just want to declare scripture over you. Worship team, you can make your way on up. John 16, 33, in this world you will have trouble. But Jesus says, take heart, I have overcome the world. Jesus says in Matthew 16, 18, on this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. 1 John 5, 4, everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. 1 John 4, 4, you dear children, are from God and have overcome them, but because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. 2 Timothy 1.7, for the spirit God gave us does not make us timid, but gives us power and love and self-discipline. Romans 8, 31 and 37, if God is for us, who can be against us? We are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Isaiah 54, 17, no weapon formed against you shall prosper. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord. 2 Timothy 4, 18, the Lord will rescue me from every evil attack and will bring me safely to his heavenly kingdom. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen. We're just going to end our time with a song of worship. And if you need prayer because of oppression or attack or influence of any kind, again, we're not just talking about prayer. We want to practice the power of prayer. If that's you, please raise your hand. If you feel like you are coming out of oppression or if you feel bombarded by an attack, can you raise your hand so we can surround you and pray for you? We have a raised hand here and a raised hand here. During our time of worship, let's just gather in close proximity. Lay a hand and pray. If you are tempted and the temptation isn't going away and you've lost hope and faith to overcome that temptation and you need to be reminded by the fact that you don't fight this battle by your might but by the might of the mighty one, and you need help as you face temptation, can you just raise your hand? And we'll come close to you and pray for you. Anytime during worship, you can raise it. We'll gather and pray. Can we stand, church? There is a war that's been won, but the battle wages on. And we do not fight this battle with the weapons of this world, but we fight this battle through the weapons of faith, of love, of hope, and of the power of prayer and the sword of the Spirit. This is how we fought our battles. Church, can we stand? 
and sing of our victory in Christ? And can we move and pray the victory of Christ over a brother and sister? Lord, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Amen. Just a couple of closing thoughts. Again, if you're new, we're so glad you came this morning. That was, that was heavy, but that's, that's real. Like, this is reality. And we just hope that your eyes are open, your heart encouraged, your hands equipped. Um, and if also you're new, you haven't been able to connect with us, there's a, a connection card, again, to the chair in front of you, in the back of that chair. We'd love for you to fill out some info, turn it in at the welcome booth on your way out. We'd love to connect with you and see how we can support you. 
Um, for those of you guys who call this church your home church, we have a, a few things in store for you. First, this upcoming Saturday is our volunteer workshop. This is an annual training, uh, a way for us to kind of dust off the cobwebs, be renewed and reminded of what to do, and not only what to do, but how to do it, and more than that, why we do it, why we serve with the best of our ability, why we show up early when we really don't want to, why we do something that seems useless, and we're reminded of the heart of service, that we do all that we do for the glory of God, not for any human being, but for the Lord, that you actually are the hands and feet of Jesus, the very welcome and hospitality of Christ to someone who walks through these doors. So can you please, if you are on a team, AV or worship, Kids Town or hospitality, security, um, oh, I'm sorry, um, hospitality, undercover, uh, security, like we'd love for you just to come and join us for a, a, a quick breakfast, a word of encouragement, and kind of just straight to the point training so you can go on the rest of your day on Saturday. The next day, October 22nd, is a really short, like 15 to 18 minute Build It Sunday for our covenant members. And we're just going to hear, we're going to see and hear from the nominees of the search team. We get to know who they are, a bit of, of their story, uh, why we feel like as a, as a governing board, um, we feel like this is a, a good group of nominees for the search team to, to search and to go through the process of adding another pastor on staff. But first, we just want you guys to see and hear from these nominees. You'll have a week to pray through, to process, um, to really consider those that you saw and heard from. You'll have wiggle room and time to call me up, to email me, or just get a hold of the office if you do have any thoughts, cares, or concerns. And then that following Sunday, October 29, we'll have physical ballots for you to cast your vote. We're not going to do the quick hand up and hand down and, okay, let's go watch the Hawks uh, type of system. We're going to have actual physical ballots. And again, if there's any issues, you can voice them safely and not be judged for feeling like you want to voice something, but you can write it down on a ballot and turn it in. Um, again, we are really excited to move this process along of developing and also solidifying a search team because y'all, I need another pastor on staff. <laughs> And that's going to be good and healthy for me, but that's going to be good and healthy for you. You need another shepherd that can really nourish you, come alongside you, and help you. I'm extremely limited, and I don't want to be the ceiling to this thing. So just a couple of things, right? The Saturday workshop, the Sunday the 22nd, a short to the point meet and greet for our nominees to the search team. The Sunday after, a really short opportunity just to cast your vote on a physical ballot. That's going to be October 29th. I just want to read... One of these verses that we just reflected on and received a moment ago as you make your way. Church, dear children, you are from God and you have overcome them because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we bless you. Go in power, go in peace. Amen.